Good. All right. Uh, so my sermon for this morning, we start off in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And honestly, this is going to be probably, interestingly enough, a sermon that's going to lack the most scripture from just about any sermon that I do. And the reason why is because it's actually a sermon about the Bible. So I'm going to be preaching. Uh, I'm going to be going over just an overview of the entire Bible. Right, and just the structure, the divisions, what's found in all the books. And, and you know, it may be a little dry. I'm going to try not to make it too dry. But, but it's important to understand and have a full high level view of the scripture, of how things relate to each other. When you're reading the Bible, we just got done reading the whole New Testament in January. Hopefully you're reading your Bible cover to cover. And it's easy to, you know, you read your Bible, but sometimes you don't get as much of the understanding as you could have when you understand how all the pieces fit together. You understand how all the books relate to one another. You understand how they're divided. And, oh, when I'm reading this, because, you know, I mean, for the longest time, I remember you read the book of Romans and you just, you don't even think about it. Just like, well, that's the Romans and this is, you know, whatever. Like you don't even, you don't even acknowledge or even understand a whole lot early on. And hopefully as you read more, you know, the, the, it all fits together. But I want to just take time today to just, just preach a sermon that's going to outline the entire Bible, the time frame, when things are taking place, and, and just sort of go into that. So we started with the scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where the Bible says in verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Bible, the word of truth, is to be divided. And the biggest division that we see in the scripture is the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Right? And we need to understand the differences and, and be able to identify, you know, it's all the word of God and it's all profitable for doctrine. It's all profitable for instruction in righteousness. Right? It's, it's, it's all profitable for these things, but we need to understand that we could be a good workman, that we don't get into false doctrine, that we could, we could have good, solid doctrine, and that we wouldn't be ashamed either. So one of the things as being a believer, as being a Christian, is you ought to have as much knowledge as possible with the things of God, and especially with His Word, right? We, we ought to be prepared. We ought to be ready to instruct other people, especially non-believers, but also anyone in the faith, to be able to be a resource to help guide and instruct and teach. We are workmen, and, and part of that being prepared to be a workman is to study. And we want to study not just to show ourselves approved unto man, but to show ourselves approved unto God. Right? So God's, God has preserved, God has delivered His words, miraculously has delivered His words for us which is very special, it's very, uh, um, you know, amazing that God's able to do this and we ought to treat God's word with respect, with reverence and with great care and, and love the word of the Lord and love these things to be able to, um, you know, continue to teach and help other people, right? So getting your understanding right is just going to help you to be a better workman for the Lord. And that's, that's the, the foundation of, of, you know, kind of going into this sermon. But a lot of people don't have, and, and you know, many of you, I, I hope this isn't just too elementary for you. Maybe there's something that you can pick up that you didn't know before and then praise God for that. But it's important to, to do this every once in a while. I've never, I've actually never done this before. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. But even you know, where, you know, where I'm at, in gen just in my own spiritual life, in my own spiritual growth, my own understanding, I still haven't gone as far into this study as I would like to. And that's one of the reasons I put it off for a long time because I always was like, well, I want to know, I, I want to do this research and this study and do this before I bring up this subject. But there comes a point in time where I got to go, you know what, we're just going to go over this now while I continue to study and, you know, get at least the information that I can relay to you. Now, this isn't, com there, there's a lot of commentaries and, you know, theologians and people who have gone over this level. It, I mean, it just makes sense, right, that, there's, that there'd be a lot of discussion about this. But I didn't take this 
really from any, any source in particular. There's a, there's a natural division of scripture that you can see, and there's an obvious one too. And, and the way that the books were collected and canonized and put in order actually makes sense. Now, um, there's, there's even stuff, there's even, there's even things to learn on the order of the scripture. Because they were put in, it's, not, it's definitely not random at all. And, and the way that, it, that it's put together makes a lot of sense. And we're going to dig into this. So um, I'm going to start just at the beginning and we're going to go all the way to the end. And I don't necessarily have a lot of scripture to turn to today, but we're talking about the Bible, right? So we're talking about the scripture without going into too much of God's word. So we start off the very beginning of the Bible. Obviously, we have the book of Genesis. And great place to start, Genesis. It's the beginning. It's the birth. It's the, you know, it starts with the creation and then gives us a lot of history. There's actually a lot of time encompassed just in the book of Genesis when it comes to the history of the world, of the universe, of the earth, right, of everything. And chapter one starts off with just the creation. Great place to start. Everything is made six days and God rests on the seventh. And then that's also the book where we learn about the patriarchs. So we learn about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? And then at the end of Genesis, it ends with the death of Joseph. Okay, that's, that encompasses that book of Revelation. And then from there, you continue to move forward in time. And you're, what we're going to find in the scripture is that there's these chunks where you are moving chronologically, with very few, you know, variations from that. And you might have a book in between where it's still maintained in time frame if it's not exactly, you know, start to finish. So Genesis, you start with creation, you end with Joseph's death. So in between there, I mean, you've got the flood. You know, you've got thousands of years, essentially, just in that time frame alone. From the creation to Abraham's birth, you actually have 2,008 years. So if you think about that, that's a, that's a long span of time. Like, I mean, it's been 2,020 years since, 21 years since the birth of Christ. So that same amount of time, that whole time span is encapsulated in the Bible in a very, very, very short book, right? Just, just up to the birth of Abraham, that's like, two, you know, 2,000 years. Um, but the Bible gives us all the information that we need to know about that time, especially about the flood and about other things. And, you know, obviously in the beginning, there's less people and there's less things going on in general. So um, that's just Exodus is essentially the story of Moses. Right. And, and a way to remember, you know, Genesis, the word Genesis means like it's a creation or it's a beginning. So that's easy to remember. Exodus, it's uh, it's the the expelling of the children of Israel. So there's that, that mass exodus, that word means, and I don't have the exact definition, but just understanding of the word means it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big expelling, right? So Moses and the children of Israel are leaving Egypt. That's the exodus, and that's how you can remember that. But that, that whole book encompasses the story of Moses, he, you know, the burning bush, Meeting God, if you will, you know, hearing from the Lord, receiving the law of the Lord. And we see these things laid out in the book of Exodus. And then we get to Leviticus. Leviticus is an outlining basically of the Levitical law. So Leviticus has the word Levi in there. Levi, it's, the, it's the, under the priesthood of Levi is where it is, is what God ordained to kind of, you know, to be the priests, to be the, the arbiters, to be the, the, you know, if you will, the judges, the, the men of God, they're going to serve the Lord. They're receiving from the Lord. They're teaching the people. And God has given the law to, ultimately, to the Levites. Where he gave it to Moses, and they're going to be the ones in charge of, of ruling and judging and things like that. They're the priests. And um, this is under God's... Um, God's design. He didn't design for mankind to have a king. 
He didn't design for there to be, you know, th this is the structure that God would have for mankind in his perfect design. And that's where God is the king. God is supreme. God's law is the law of the land. And we're going to obey God. And God is the supreme authority. And his word is, is above all else. And then he's designed for man to be judges of that word, to be judges of uh, his law and to make sure that things are running according to God's law. So we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus is that law which just details um, God's law. And after that is the book of Numbers and then the book of Deuteronomy. And Numbers, just as you might imagine, has to deal with accounting for the children of Israel. And that's why you have a lot of genealogies in the book of numbers because it's it's specifying you know the genealogies are important to determine who can be in what role um, when it comes to the Levites and there and and you know the different brand the different descendants of Levi because you have you know under Aaron were the priests and then other Levites had other jobs specific to them based on their genealogy and it also accounts for the travels of Israel after they leave Egypt and then before they get into the promised land. So during that time, they're wandering through the wilderness of sin, they're doing all the travels. The book of Numbers records all of those things. So a lot of people look at the book of Numbers as kind of a boring book because basically you're just reading a lot of names. The first nine chapters of Numbers has to do with genealogies with just a little bit of story here and there mixed in. And then after that, you've got, they traveled here and went here and you get a little bit more exciting, you know, reading. But that's the book of Numbers. And then you've got the book of Deuteronomy. Now, those first five books of the Bible are partitioned into, you know, they have their own um, category, right? Oftentimes they're referred to as, all five books being referred to as the Law of Moses or the Books of Moses because Moses is the one attributed with all five of those books. And just, you know, we'll see this also later on. But you could say, well, how could Moses be responsible for the book of Genesis? I mean, all that stuff happened before he was even born. But see, that's how God uses man. And just, uh, again, we have, to, we have to look at the Bible as understanding that it's a book of God. God is the author of the scripture. So humanly speaking, yeah, how could Moses write a book about people and about, about creation that... No man was at. How could you write about day one? How could you write about day two? You weren't there. You weren't an eyewitness because it's the word of God. Because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why. So God is the author. God is the one giving us the information. That's why we treat the Bible with the authority that it has because it's God's word. Because it's not man's word. Because God used human beings to be the instrumentation of actually putting pen to paper and writing down the words that he wants us to have. That's how Moses was able to deliver these books. And that's how Moses was, he didn't just come up with the law on his own either. On all of what's right, what's wrong, what should all the punishments be. God gave that to him. These aren't just all out of the imagination of Moses' heart. Because if it was out of the imagination of his heart, he would have gotten it wrong. <laughs> he, wouldn't have, he, wouldn't have done a, he wouldn't have done a perfect job. But... So the book of, of Deuteronomy, where I was just finishing up there, that's this, basically it's called, the, it's the second giving of the law. And that's, that's inherent in the word Deuteronomy. It, it means it's the second law, it's the second giving of that law, where it's a reiteration. And you get a little bit of, of, of more detail on certain things in the book of Deuteronomy, but essentially it's mirroring, you know, it's another witness, another testimony of the law, of God's law. So that's why you're going to find, like, for example, the Ten Commandments you're going to find in Exodus 20, you're also going to find in Deuteronomy. So you're going to have this, this second giving of the law, which is given a little bit later in Moses' life, where he's just recounting all of the law. And the book of Deuteronomy then ends with the death of Moses. So in Genesis, you got the creation, you get Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Jacob's renamed to Israel. So then as you read through the rest of the Bible, you hear the children of Israel. It's the children of Jacob. That's, that's ultimately that nation derives because they're all spawned from uh, Jacob. 
and those books, now those first five books of the Bible, you may also hear other words used to talk about those besides being the Law of Moses. Another word is Pentateuch, and Penta means five, so it's the five books of Moses. And, you know, I don't like, I don't use this terminology as much because not everybody knows it. And it's, it's you know, these are more words that either, you know, people who are really into Hebrew or into uh, sounding smart or theology and, you know, using these terms. They like to throw these around and, and oftentimes, not everyone who does it, but a lot of people will just want to sound smart and they, you know, they talk about these things in a, in a scholarly manner. So you'll hear Pentateuch or you'll hear the Torah or Torah, right? Now, Torah is, it has a lot of different meanings depending on who you're talking to. It could mean like all of Judaism law. It could mean the first five books. It could mean all these different things. So that one's got a loose, a, a little bit more of a loose association. Many people can use, you know, Torahs of the, four, the first five books of the Bible. But just so you're aware, I mean, people may use these terms, right? It's important just to at least hear them and understand what they are so you know and you're not ignorant of what they're talking about when you talk about these things. Um, those are the first five books of the Bible, books of Moses. The law can, you know, is contained in those first five books, very beginning of the scripture. We continue on chronologically as well with the book of Joshua. Joshua, of course, takes over as the leader of Israel after Moses dies. So we ended up Deuteronomy with the death of Moses. We're starting off the book of Joshua with Joshua now you know, being the one in charge, being the one in power, and he is the one that's going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And the book of Joshua basically chronicles all of those battles, all those victories, and, and, and uh, the children of Israel coming in and conquering the land. And everything that's associated with that and dividing up the land like Moses said to do, and that's in the book of Joshua. After that is the book of Judges. And this encapsulates the time after Joshua, so they've, they've inherited the land, and now they're basically just living, right? They're, they're, they're doing their thing. They have these battles. They have, you know, enemies attacking and different things going on. And this is the time span before they decide they want to have a king. And this is where they're basically supposed to be operating the way that God said that they should be operating. Now, so again, put things in context in years of human history. The creation to Abraham's birth, we said it was about 2,000 years, 2,008 years, right? From Abraham's birth then to Moses' exodus is 720 years. So even in that time from between Abraham and Moses, you've got, you've got 700 years. It's a lot of time. And then we have from the Exodus, which is where we ended, up until the building of the temple, which we're going to see that in um, ultimately in First Kings. So that's where we get all the way up to First Kings is where Solomon builds a temple. That's 480 years. Now, these are all just different milestones, and I'm not going to go through this. Pastor Anderson actually did a really good, I think he preached a sermon about this, about the age of the earth. And, and I agree, I, I've, I was there for that, I listened to that, and I've gone through and studied that out myself, and I agree with, with what he comes up with for the years. Because it's, you know, there's a lot of people say a lot of different things. And if you just go online, and this is why I encourage you, you know, study to show yourself approved unto God. All this study, I'm here to try to help and try to bring everything together, but you really need to do these studies on your own and make sure you're familiar with all the different books, with the passages, with what is the Bible talking about. If you, if you wanted to, you know, if you're talking to someone, and this is why it's important, think about it. If, you, if you're talking to someone and any subject comes up and you want to explain what the Bible says about that subject, it's good at the very least to have a ballpark idea of where you should turn to in the Bible to try to find that subject to, to talk about where you say, hey, well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Whether it be you're talking to someone else or even for your own benefit, if you want to know where something is, you need to sit back and think about it rationally, think about it logically, and think about it just based on the books of the Bible. What do I know about the Bible? 
Well, if I want to know what God thinks about anything that might be a crime, that anything that might be a sin, you know where good places to go to? The law. The law. So you go back to Exodus, you go back to Leviticus, you go back to Deuteronomy. Those are good places to get a good idea. What, well, how does God think about these things? And just knowing what the books even represent, because unfortunately, so many Christians today, they don't even know anything about what, why the books are even named what they're named or what happens in those books. First Samuel, what's that about? Right? Or, you know, the, the getting into the minor prophets, which we'll get into that a little bit later. Joel, Amy, people are like, uh, we've had people comment, I've seen comments just on our church, especially when we first started the church, because, you know, our text verse comes from the book of Nahum for a stronghold Baptist church. And people are like, Nahum, that's not even a book of the Bible. Where'd you get this from? It's like, oh man, you're so ignorant. And these are people, you know, I think that we're, we're claiming to be Christians. Like, you don't even know all of the books of the Bible. You don't even know that they exist. You're hearing this like it's the first time you've ever heard of that book of the Bible. And you know what? That's a shame, which is why we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And just the basic understanding of, of all the books of the Bible and getting this overview is a great place to start. So Joshua, he leads the children of Israel into battle, chronicles all their battles. Then we get into the book of Judges, as I mentioned. And this covers the time frame from Joshua all the way up to Samuel. Because Joshua was a judge. Samuel was the last judge, okay, because he was the last judge because after him, that's when King Saul becomes king. That's when Saul is ordained king. And, um, man, that's, <laughs> that's distracting. <laughs> I feel like we're at war. <laughs> like this helicopter going overhead, like, what in the world? Now, the book of the Judges, there's, there's, we, we've done Bible studies through Joshua and Judges, and, and they're great books to read through. Lots of exciting things happening there. But essentially, that's, that was supposed to have been the way that God designed things to be. And then after Judges, you have the book of Ruth. Now, Ruth is just, you know, it's four chapters, a short story, but it takes place, chronologically speaking, during the time of the Judges which is why it's included here at this point in Scripture. So you've got the five books of Moses, and then you've got, which now I forgot to mention, is we've entered into what would be categorized as the historical books. Okay, just going through all of this history. So as we get through the judges and you know, Joshua and the judges, and then through the kings and all the, the ruling of the whole nation of Israel, essentially, to the carrying away of them being captive, all of this is history. They're historical books. It's giving you a lot of facts. Now, obviously, there's a lot of good teaching and doctrine and other things to learn, but it's still just, just outlined the way it's written, just being very historical in its presentation. So Ruth is the story of this Moabite woman who came with Naomi. You know, and you, you know, if you don't know the story of Ruth, read that story. But it's inserted here, and again, I think it's great placement because it, it happens during the time of the Judges, and it happens near, closer to the end of the time of the Judges, and what we see here is an insight into the story of some of David's heritage, King David's heritage. That Ruth is actually part of that lineage because Ruth marries Boaz, and then Boaz begets Obed, and Obed begets Jesse, and Jesse begets David. So Jesse is David's father. Obed is, is David's grandfather. So Boaz is David's great-grandfather. So as far as the history is concerned, when you get to the book of Ruth, this is at the time frame of David's great-grandfather being alive, the story of David's great-grandfather and Ruth. So then when we get into 1 Samuel, because that's the next book, you have 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel is the story of Samuel, right? How Samuel came to be this priest because Eli is dropping the ball, Eli and his sons. You know, his whole house gets, gets destroyed because of their sin. So God uses Samuel 
to be that last judge, to be that final judge for the children of Israel. He's the one that Israel is looking to, uh, to be the, the leader. And ultimately with Samuel, that's when the children of Israel go, well, we want, it. we want to be like the rest of the nations. We want a king that's going to go out and fight our battles for us. We want a king to do all this stuff like the kings of the other nations do. So give us a king. And that's where God tells Samuel, you know what? We're going to give him a king. And don't worry about it, Samuel, because they haven't rejected you. Because Samuel's upset that they want this king because he knows that's not, that's not what God wanted. That's not what God ordained. God wants them to have God as a king. He said, but he says, tell Samuel, you know, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me. Because ultimately they didn't want God to be the king over them. They just wanted to have some human being, some man to be their king and to fight their battles for them. God says, no, you fight. No, we don't want to fight. We want someone else to do it for us. And so during the book of, of 1 Samuel, we've got the story of Samuel. And then Saul is ordained that king. So you get, and then you get basically the whole story of Saul. And then we're also introduced to David and, and a lot of the things that David did in, in his friendship with Jonathan and everything else and how David interacts with, with Saul's family and Saul's life. And then the book of 1 Samuel ends with Saul's death. So that whole reign of Saul is over by the end of 1 Samuel. 2 Samuel is basically all about King David. The entire book of 2 Samuel has to do with the reign of King David because Saul is dead. Now David's taken over and everything that happens during the reign of David being king happens in the book of 2 Samuel. From there, we go into 1 Kings. 1 Kings, of course, starts off essentially with the story of Solomon, right? And the rebuild or the building of the temple of God. And Solomon has a, a significant chunk at the beginning of 1 Kings. And it goes the kings all the way from Solomon to Jehoshaphat. Now, first and second kings, you're going to see information not just on the kings of Judah, but also the kings of Israel. And that's where you get most of the information on the kings of Israel as well. And you have this back and forth as you progress through first and second kings. Because after, um, after the reign of Solomon, Solomon got into that sin, God decided to split the kingdom up into two and rend most of the kingdom away from Solomon or from his son Rehoboam and divided it because of Solomon's great sin that he sinned. So from that, from that time forward, you've got two kingdoms. You've got the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, essentially. And you've got different kings reigning in each one. So you're going to see this back and forth of the king of Israel, you know, starts here, lives for this many years and rules and reigns and you kind of hear their story and then depending on how long the other king's going. So like if one king's reigning for 50 years, you're going to keep reading about these stories of the kings of Israel, right? The king of Judah reigns for 52 years. Well, like Isaiah, you're going to see the kings of Israel for all of those time, that whole time frame until you have another transition on the other side of the fence. That makes sense, right? So it's, it's, it's trying to keep as much in order chronologically as possible. So as you're going through 1st and 2nd Kings, you're going to get that. 1st Kings goes from Solomon to Jehoshaphat, where also is contained the prophet Elijah. It's all the stories about Elijah. And then in 2nd Kings, you've got the stories of Elisha, and of course, the rest of the kings of Israel and Judah all the way until they get taken captive. So that's what those books are about. And then in 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Chronicles is, an, is essentially another telling of the stories of the kings. But 1st and 2nd Chronicles focuses pretty much solely on Judah. You're not going to find, I mean, you still have these references because Israel is, is a part of the history of Israel. Israel and Judah, and you've got these wars and all these different interactions and things like that. So it's not like you don't hear about Israel, but it's not chronicling all of the kings the way that first and second kings do. You're getting mostly just the perspective of, um, of Judah, and these are written at different times from one another, which is another reason why you're going to see, and, and I'm going to pause here just for a minute to understand this. When people who hate the Bible want to attack the Bible, they're going to say, oh, you've got all these contradictions in the Bible. A lot of what they're going to bring up are going to come up between differences between 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. 
because they they overlap. It's 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 the same time frame that they're that they're talking about. And normally, what you'll see in those books is like they they want to show you. Oh well, this says this many people or that many horses, and they try to show all these differences in numbers. But what you have to understand is that when you're especially when you're using the numbers and counting things, is that there are many ways of dealing with how you deal with counting anything. And when you've got two different people looking at it from, you know, kind of two different perspectives, you can get, I want to say different answers. You could get things recorded in a different manner than the other one while both of them being true simultaneously. And I'm trying to think of a good example off the top of my head. I know one that's real common is like, well, how many, uh, how many horses did King Solomon have at, at one instance? And, you know, there's one, and I, and I don't remember the exact numbers. I don't remember what they're saying. Like one says like 20,000, another says like 2,000, okay? This is an example of someone saying, oh, see, look, this one, they left off a zero. So, you know, you're, you're, you believe that the word of God is inerrant and there's no mistakes, no error. Well, what about that? But when you read it and you look at it closely, the numbers aren't wrong. And see, don't ever feel like you need to run to this, oh, it's a copyist error. Oh, it's this other error. Oh, oh, you know, this is just a mistake. And... There isn't any mistakes. You can trust in the Word of God. Because God doesn't make mistakes. And God preserved His Word without error, which we have today. But when, like in that example, the difference is there's, there's like total number of horses and then there's chariots. There's a total number of chariots. And it has to do with the stalls, like how many stalls, horse stalls you have and things like that. And, and chariot stalls. When you think of a chariot, the chariots are going to use more than one horse. Right, so on one hand, you could be accounting for each individual horse. On the other hand, you're accounting for a chariot, which has, you know, say, 10 horses per chariot or whatever. Right? If you're off by a factor of 10, it's pretty easy to see that, well, you only have this many stalls because it's, you don't need as many when you're, you're storing the entire train, right? all of them in one place, whatever. Things like that, you can look at it either way. You look at your resources different, you know, and, and you just have to be careful at reading the words. And, and this sermon I'm not, uh, is not designed to answer all of the objections. I've done that in sermons in the past. But I just wanted to point out the difference between 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Kings is going to be a place where a lot of people are going to turn to to try to upend your faith in the Word of God because you do have these stories kind of from different perspectives and counting different things. But... Um, so in, in First Chronicles, you've got the first nine chapters dealing with genealogies. And then you've got the death of Saul in chapter 10, and the rest of the book deals with David and his temple preparations and genealogies and things like that in First Chronicles. And then Second Chronicles is Solomon to the carrying away into Babylon. And it mostly just deals, as I said before, with the kings of Judah. So that's where you're going to find in First and Second Chronicles. From there, geneolo or chronologically speaking, because now we've gone from the creation, Abraham, Moses, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. They come into the promised land. They're ruling. They've got the king, or excuse me, the, the judges. And then they, they want kings. So then they've got kings for a few hundred years. And then they get taken away, taken captive into Babylon for their sin. Because they rejected the Lord. They're serving other gods. God's had enough, and they go into Babylon. Well, after the 70 years that they're in captivity, for Judah, in captivity, God's going to bring them back into their land. And this is where we have the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And of course, we're reading the book of Esther in our Wednesday night Bible study. Ezra, the story of Ezra has to do with the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra was a priest. Ezra was a scribe. So everything that we read about in Ezra, it's, it's the facilitating of that temple being rebuilded in Jerusalem, right? Because the, the, the time of their captivity, God is bringing to an end. God works in the heart of King Cyrus to, to authorize the rebuilding of this temple. 
And that's what Ezra is about. And then Nehemiah is from the perspective of the governor, Nehemiah. He's going to be the ruler of that area. And he's rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls and all the infrastructure. So you've got first Ezra dealing with the, with the temple. And then Nehemiah dealing with just the overall building of Jerusalem. And then you've got the book of Esther, which is this story that takes place during this time frame. So in what you see that's common between Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther is that there's all these obstacles against the Jews, against God's people, against the, doing, you know, the building of Jerusalem, against the building of the temple. And what we're seeing in Esther also is just you know, Haman trying to, to destroy and annihilate all of God's people, right? So all of these obstacles, all this opposition and happening essentially all around the same time, around the same years. Then from there, we transition into another set of books. So those were, we had the, the, the books of Moses, the historical books. Then when we start with Job, we get into Job. These are what's known as the poetic books or books of wisdom. Okay, poetic because they include Psalms and Proverbs. You've got Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon are the next books that are kind of chunked out. They're, they have their own little division from a, from a high-level perspective where we can put all those books together they, that fit together. And one of the interesting things about Job is that chronologically it's, it's placed here. And this is where the chronology stops being just completely in order, right? Because we've gone from creation all the way up until the coming back into Jerusalem from being in captivity. And, and that's essentially where we've stopped chronologically. And, and, and up to this point, it's been very consistent and very much in order. The little bit of the reset, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, you kind of go back and retell the story, right? But you've been transitioning forward in history. Now with Job, though, it's not like Job is just going to continue in that history. The, book, the events of the book of Job are actually pretty old. Because when you look at Job's life, and, and just one of the inferences, and this is where you have to really study, and I, and I didn't do enough on this either to just be like really hitting facts hard because it takes more time to invest to figure these things out. You have to look at things. So sometimes you're going to know just from directly from the context when the events all happen because the Bible tells you when they happen. And we'll see this as we get into Minor Prophets too. The Bible tells you exactly when things happen, sometimes, but not always. Other times, this could be a little bit, you have to do more digging and research to figure out when things happen. With Job, I think one of the clearest things that we can probably deduce from Job is just based off of very simply how old Job lived to be. The Bible says that, you know, you read the story of Job, he had 10 children, he had all this wealth, God was protecting him. Satan attacks him. He loses everything, right? His friends come. They're supposed to comfort him, and they're miserable comforters, right? They don't really do a good job at all, and they're just bagging on Job, telling him he's in sin and everything else. God steps in and, and you know, basically rebukes everybody because he's God, and he's letting them know who he is. And then the story ends with... Job being blessed basically doubly with everything. And then Job has another 10 children after his first 10 children and passed away. And the Bible says at the end of Job, and hopefully I have this in my notes, and I don't, I believe it was 160 years. So it says after these things, so after all that bad, the bad stuff happened to him, he lived another 160 years. So however old he was, having the 10 children and the wealth and everything else, he lived another 160 years after that, which puts him in a category of someone who lived probably shortly after the flood. Because that's how old people were living. I mean, Abraham was one of the last recorded people that, that lived a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean like well over 100 years. Because once you get past that, people aren't just being recorded as living past 100. Not that's not happening ever, but it's, there, there's this significant change from pre-flood, people are living 800 years, 900 years, right? A super long time. 
something changes very significant at the flood event where the conditions are simply not the same and mankind is not living as long as they used to be. And then you see a really quick, you know, if people, if, if, if the average timeline of, of, you know, going through, through history, people live in nine, say 900 years up to a thousand years, it just dramatically drops off of the average expected lifespan of a human being. So after the flood, you've got people still living to be 300 years, 400 years or whatever, and it just tapers off really quickly within a few generations. So what we see, the, all that being said, you know, just a real simple thing, and you could go a lot more in depth. I'm not going to do this now, and I don't even know all of the answers on this. But Job, the events of Job happen, they had to have happened because of the length of, of years. Um, all, and, and, you know, another evidence as well, but happened way earlier on, closer to the time of Abraham than anything else. But they weren't written until much later. And one of the evidences for that is the use of Jehovah. So the word Lord, when you see the word Lord in your King James Bible in all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is the name Jehovah in Hebrew. That's, that's, that's that name. So we see, but don't worry about, oh, what do you mean that's Jehovah? It means the same thing. The word Lord, that's what Jehovah means, Lord, right? So in English, we're reading it as Lord. And that's also the way it was translated in the New Testament as well, from Greek, from the, the Hebrew into Greek, was translated as Lord. So it's not, that's not an issue, but that name wasn't known until God made himself known that way unto Moses. So if Job was living around the time pre-Moses, he, he wouldn't even know that name, yet that's the name being used in the story of Job. Which tells us, and again, it doesn't matter because he's addressing God. He is addressing the Lord, but the word that's written down is a name that he wouldn't have known. So we know that the actual physical writing was done after the life of Job. And I don't know if anyone knows or how, if you could even figure out who the author of the book of Job is, but it doesn't matter. The author is God. Amen. Don't know who the actual physical human being was that wrote it down. But those are some interesting things as you study the Bible that you'll start to see. And that takes a lot to under, of understanding to even catch those details. But you know what? One, it's cool. <laughs> it's going to help you in understanding. And you may not always be pulling that out with people. But you know what? It keeps the Bible exciting for you, hopefully. Right? When you come across this stuff and see it, you're like, wow, that's, that's actually really neat. And you start looking at things on another level. Um, it's really interesting. So the book of Job, obviously you've got a lot of word, like the Lord just speaking for chapters. And that's really cool too, where God is just addressing Job and just and, and all of these great bits of wisdom coming out of God's mouth. You know, where were you when, you know, I did this and did that? Do you know how this works and how that works? And, you know, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a timeless book. Mankind today needs to, to have that same type of rebuke, I think, from the Lord. You think you're so smart? Oh, you got all this technology and you think you know how the... You can't even tell me how the bones grow in the womb. Right. And you can't. I mean, doctors might try to tell you that they know. Right. Scientists they might tell you, but they're full of baloney. Right. They can see and record how things happen, but they don't actually know how it happens. They can't reproduce that. They can get God's materials that God already has to do the same thing that God designed it to do, but they can't do that. We need humility in God's creation. Look, I'm all for studying God's creation, understanding biology and medicine and every, you know, great. I want to learn more about what, how God designed us. But you know what? Mankind still reaches a limit. Because life is a miracle. Life is a miracle of God. It truly is. You can tell me, yeah, well, it takes a, a sperm and an egg to come together. Okay, well, where does the life come from? Yeah, I know that, 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 that this process needs to take place. 
What is actually happening in that process? You don't know. What causes those cells to divide? You can see the cells dividing. You can see information passing. Why is it doing that? How is it doing? We don't know. You don't know. People are going to tell you that they know. They don't. But that's... <laughs> I'm good. I don't want to get too far off, off, off topic here. That's the book of Job. Then we move into the book of Psalms. Psalms is a, so a song book, right? Obviously, it's scripture. And most of the Psalms were penned down by David, by King David. He introduced a lot of music. Book of Psalms. Psalms itself is divided into five books. So we have chapters. Chapter 1 through 41 is book 1. Chapters 42 to 72 is book 2. 73 to 89 is book 3. 90 to 106 is book 4. And 107 to the end, 150 is book 5. They're, they're in five collections of the Psalms. So uh, if you didn't know that before, that is true. That is a fact. That's the way that they were um, passed down. Um, I don't know how much significance there is when you're reading. Obviously, you know, it's all God's word, but take it for what it is. Then we move into from Psalms, from the songs that mostly was recorded by David. We get into Proverbs, which is mostly his son Solomon and just great wisdom um, from God and also Ecclesiastes again from Solomon and then Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. Depending on, on how that's named, you might hear either one of those or see them in your Bible. Um, very uh, good poetry there, uh, uh, beautiful language um, about love between man and woman. Obviously, there's a lot more spiritual symbolism there. And those are those books of, that are kind of known as the poetic books. Then we get into the major prophets. Okay, major prophets, you got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. And major prophets is essentially just... They're, they're really long books. Now, Daniel isn't as long, but um, these are the bigger books. It's easy to remember that way. It's, those are the reason why they're called the major prophets. Now, this is where things can get really interesting. I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to spend too much time because I know I still got the whole New Testament to go through. You can tie in a lot of understanding here, and, and this is where I'm going to recommend doing some extra studying too. You've already read the history, so you know a lot of major events that are going on from First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Judges, right, whatever. These prophets that we're going to get into now for the rest of the Old Testament is all just books of prophets, okay, writings of prophets. So you got Jeremiah, Isaiah, or Isaiah Jeremiah. Lamentations is also from Jeremiah, and then um, Ezekiel. These are all taking place, well, I'll, I'll tell each one specifically, but during different time periods, and you can know when they are. And what's interesting about that is when you see different trouble, different problems, and what God's preaching to the people, oftentimes you're going to see, you know, this hard preaching happening during the time of a reign of a good king. So you can't just assume, well, there's this good king, so everything must be going great, and all the children of Israel are loving the Lord and following God, yet you're going to see some of the hardest preaching coming through during those times. And vice versa. You know, so you can see, you could, you could start to paint the bigger picture of, oh, I didn't know Jeremiah is out there preaching while this king is leading and doing these events, and you start to put those together, it gives you a, a more full picture of what's going on. So, with the book of Isaiah, he is around during, and right at the very beginning, it says, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, during their reigns. This is during this whole ministry of Isaiah where he's preaching. It happens at that time frame. So you could go back and look well, what happened during the reigns of those kings? And relate the preaching of Isaiah with those stories and see how they fit together. In the days of... Um, oh, one of, oh, man, my notes are screwed up here. So... 
So, okay, I'm getting my mind back here, but something screwed up on my print here. One of the other cool things about the book of Isaiah is that people often refer to it as a mini Bible. There's 66 books or chapters, excuse me, in the book of Isaiah, and there's 66 books of the Bible. So you've got 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. So 66 total. And each chapter, and I can't say this, I haven't studied this out for every single chapter, but it is really, really interesting. So if you start with Genesis or with, with chapter one of Isaiah, essentially what you can see or what you find is that something in the book of Genesis is referenced. Maybe not directly, but, but you'll find something, some common thread, some common theme with the book of Genesis in chapter 1 of Isaiah, with the book of Exodus in chapter 2, and so on and so forth. So each one of the chapters going all the way to Revelation and Isaiah 66, you'll be able to see these tie-ins. And some of them are just amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. Some of the prophecies in Isaiah, when you get into the New Testament, where they match up with Gospels and stuff, it's like, Man, that's super cool because you have almost the exact same phrases being used or words being used in the books. So I haven't gone through every single one. So I'm not going to stand up here and say that this is a fact, but I've seen enough of the examples where it's really cool. And it's kind of hard to not think that it applies all the way around. But which is also interesting because that can also lead to an instruction that, you know, even the books of the Bible being in the order they're in is divinely inspired and, and, and that God had that order for us to have the books of the Bible in, which is really cool. Uh, so that's something interesting. Another thing to study out for yourself and see if that holds true. Does, is, that, is that correct? And now here's the thing with these prophets is that you do have uh, we, we start to get into some more chronology again, right? With those poetic books, they're kind of put in the middle there. But you've got Job, which would be technically the oldest, and then Psalms during the time of David, and then Proverbs with um, Solomon. But, but that's like the most chronology you're going to get. But here you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Lamentations kind of grouped together, and then Ezekiel. Uh, Isaiah is pre-carrying away into Babylon. Jeremiah is pre and post. So Jeremiah preaches before the captivity and during the captivity, right? So, so he's kind of in between there. And then Ezekiel is in the captivity. He's preaching during the captivity. And one of the interesting things about, about Ezekiel is that he had to lay, you know, we're talking about someone being used of God, and this is a, a quick fun fact, if you didn't know this, he had to lay on his left side for 390 days and on his right side for 40 days to show a day for a year for the captivity of Israel and Judah and how long that was going to, like God's prophecy of how long that was going to last. I've got it easy to come up here and just preach. Now, I'm not saying I'm in Ezekiel, right? But to be used of God, like, like if I just have to be a preacher, and preach God's word. Amen. That's great. Yeah, I, lo I love doing that. But, but to do some of the things that Ezekiel did, man, he was put through a lot of things. And when he was, when he was laying on his side, he had to prepare like food and stuff. But the food, the food that he had to eat, God originally said he had to eat his own dung. And then when Ezekiel... <laughs> Petition the Lord to, to not have to do that. He replaced his own dung with cow's dung. And he did it. Laying on one side for over a year and, and rationing and eating dung and then flip over on the other side and prophesying and everything else. So, it's amazing. I mean, God, God used people to, you know, really hammer home a point and, and to get things through. And, um, yeah, these, these people ought to be looked to as, as heroes of the faith. 
because they were willing to do whatever, whatever God said for them to do. And then, of course, we get into the book of Daniel. Daniel is, uh, is definitely during the captivity. You, you know, there's no doubt about that of when, of when everything happens there. He's, you know, he's of the children of Israel, and he was younger and, and brought into the king's presence because he's, you know, um, he excelled already just, just I think, uh, with his intelligence and things like that to be someone that would be useful in, in the king, um, in the service of the king. And then he gets all the, a lot of prophecy comes near the end of Daniel. So we get some really cool stories of the book of Daniel. And then we get into the minor prophets. So I have these listed here, but I'll let you do this study. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And they're relatively speaking, again, in chronological order going through these times so with Hosea, it's Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were the kings of Judah during the time of his preaching, when, when these things are going on. And then um, going to Malachi, which is, I don't know exactly, I don't know if anyone knows for sure, but how much before. He's kind of the last prophet that we have record of here before Christ coming and starting his ministry. So before the New Testament, he's like that, that last minor prophet there before the New Testament. So then we have the division of the New Testament, and I'm already at time, but I'm going to just basically, you know, and, and people are more familiar with the New Testament anyways, so I spent more time on the Old Testament. Just hopefully, you know, trying to get your, your mind wrapped around the years. And just, um, oh, one last thing. So the creation, Abraham's birth, I, I didn't finish off all the years I have here. 2008 years. Abraham's birth to, Mo, um, to Moses to the Exodus was 720 years. So 2,700 years just to the Exodus. And then the temple being built from that Exodus, 480 years. And then to the captivity, when the temple was built to captivity, is 420 years. So about 420 years of the reigning of the kings, right? And about 400 years of the judges. So you've got about 400 years of judges, 400 years of kings, essentially. And then uh, 70 years of being in captivity. And then you've got, after the captivity, um, or from, from Cyrus giving the decree into the birth of Christ is 500 years, 536 years. So from the time the captivity is, is ending, during this time, and again, it's not during the time of the minor prophets, because a lot of the minor prophets are preaching during the time of the kings. But some of the minor prophets will be taking place probably after the captivity. You've got that 500 years until the birth of Christ. Then, of course, the divisions in the New Testament. You've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? Four counts, testimonies, eyewitness testimonies, people who were with Jesus Christ during his ministry, giving accounts of Jesus Christ, the things that he said. And then you've got kind of this historical book of the book of Acts after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All, everything that his disciples were doing, the apostles were doing, all the work they're doing, all those great acts that they did. And then you get into the epistles of Paul. So the apostle Paul writes these epistles. And the word epistle just means it's a letter. Right? The apostle Paul is writing letters. And I subdivide these into two categories. The first set, starting with Romans, is he's writing to churches. So he's writing to the Romans, he's writing to the church at Rome and to all the people there. And he's sending these letters, these epistles, which is the word of God unto these various churches. So you've got the Romans, you've got the, the church at Corinth. So first and second Corinthians, they get two epistles sent to them. Um, the church at Galatia, Ephesus. Philippi, Colossae, that's, so that's where you get Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, um, the Thessalonians, so they get two letters, those are grouped together for a second Thessalonians. And then we get into the pastoral epistles where he's not writing to churches, but he's writing to specific people, to pastors, right? So Timothy gets two letters, first and second Timothy, Titus gets a letter, and Philemon gets a letter. These are all epistles that Paul writes that are, that are, Definitely the, you know, the, 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 the penship of Paul, he's the one, the human instrument being used to deliver God's word um, in all of these various letters. Now, 
how does all of this get canonized? I'm not going to get too deep into that, but basically the churches were already commanded that the, you know, the letters that they receive, they're supposed to share basically among each other. And, and even though they're directed for a particular church at the time, they also were to be sharing these letters and back and forth and they end up canonizing these things as they, as they know that they're the word of God. Um, and again, that, that, that kind of, I probably shouldn't have even brought that up just because that's a, that's a whole nother uh, can of worms in itself to, to go through how these things are determined. And then from there, from the, the epistle of Paul, you've got the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is, like it says, it's designed to explain to people who were Hebrews, like the, the, the physical Jews, the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament, how things are going to change, how you don't, you no longer have these sacrifices because Christ is the sacrifice, and you have, you know, the, the priesthood being changed from the Levitical priesthood to the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. That's what you see in the Book of Hebrews. So again, you know, if you want to know church instruction, what should the churches be doing? Well, you're probably going to want to look at one of the epistles to a church. Right? You find them somewhere in there. You want to know, you know what some of the differences are in Old Testament and New Testament. Well, look at the book of Hebrews. It's a great place to look. Now, it doesn't mean there's not information in other books, but it's, it's this general understanding and knowing, okay, well, what are these books about? What, what's the, the big theme of all these different books? Then you can go back and start your research there. And then you've got these general epistles after the book of Hebrews, which are these just epistles written by different uh, people uh, talking about various things. So you got the epistle of James, Peter has two epistles, first and second Peter, and then John, the apostle John, who, you know, was responsible for the book of John and the book of Revelation has three epistles, first, second, and third John. And they're written to just people or to general audiences, right? So they're called the general epistles. And then you have the general epistle of Jude. And then the last book, of course, is the book of Revelation, which stands on its own. It's that prophetic book. It's the, the end cap on the Bible. You go from the, the creation to the new heaven and new earth, right? Which should encompass all of human history on this planet. So we start at with time as we know it, and we end going into eternity. And that's the overview of the Bible. Like I said, I, you know, hopefully, you know, maybe you, you, if you didn't learn anything brand new, I apologize, but this is important stuff to know. Hopefully there was something in there that, was, that, that you didn't know before. It's interesting. But I just want to stress the importance of knowing the Bible. Knowing it. I made notes. I, I debated whether I should even make notes or not, but I, I, the reason why I made notes for myself is because I don't want to say anything wrong. I never want to say anything inaccurate. All of this stuff, we should just know. You should know it. And if you don't know it, don't feel bad, but, but study. Right? Get to know it. Right? Just, just say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I intimately know the Word of God and that I can turn wherever and, and help explain something to someone and know what these verses say or at least know where to find them. Now, maybe you're not there yet because it takes time to learn. Right? You, you can't just, just you know, like, like the Matrix, plug in and just have this stuff downloaded in your brain and you just know it all of a sudden. Right? That, that, that's not the way life is. You need to be able to study. It takes time. So I encourage you. Here's a, one of the things that I did that helped me out a lot. And, and the, the main purpose of this was for soul winning. Okay? Because you want to be able to give everyone an answer for the hope that's, that you, that's in you. Right? You want to be able to, to answer questions on different doctrines, different objections that people have. During your own personal reading, you come across something, you say, oh man, yeah, this, is a, this verse really talks about the Trinity. This verse talks about hell being eternal. This verse talks about, you know, works, salvation, you know, not, is not a thing. And, that, you know, whatever. All these different things are going to come up. Make notes of those. What I did in my Bible, the Bible that I took out soul winning with me, I would also read out of that Bible. Because, for one, it made it easier for me to remember where things were that I was actually reading. 
and, and I had like two columns in my, like most Bibles are. If I was talking to someone when I'm still trying to learn and remember where everything is, I could remember in my mind what side of the page it was on. Yeah. Amen. Right. right? So that was helpful going out before I had more knowledge of just, oh yeah, I know exactly where that is, right? To, to remember where things were. But I also wrote down on, on you know, because most Bibles you'll have like blank pages at the beginning or at the end of the Bible, which this one should have too, right? Blank pages, just nothing on it. I would make notes, and I had categories. I had JW, I had Mormon, I had Pentecostal, I had all of these things, okay, to help. And what that does is, one, it's going to help you be prepared when you, when you, if you have to talk to someone, and it's not embarrassing or a shame to look back and say, oh, okay, well, I want to answer a question here. What do I... Oh, okay, yeah, let's turn here. Let me show you this or whatever. But also, just the, just the act of doing that helps you to remember. Yeah, right. When you take the time to write things down and you're actually thinking about them, it will help just stick in your mind so that later on you don't need those notes. I don't need those notes anymore. Right. And it's not to brag. It's just, I, you know, after, after enough times of doing this and putting forth the effort, you end up getting to the point where you start learning more and more and the Bible comes together more to know what everything is talking about. But let's get to that point. Amen. Study. Study to show yourself approved. Get to where you know, like, oh man, yeah, I know. I know, and, and the goal, and I'm still working at this, I want to know, if you tell me a book and chapter of the Bible, I can tell you what that talks about. I'm not at that point. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. If you just said any random chapter, I can't tell you what the, the, just even the general theme is of, of that one chapter. But I'd like to be at that point. That's a goal of mine. I would like to be able to tell you, oh yeah, Matthew 1 is this, Matthew 2 is this, Matthew 3 is this, and, and I mean just through, not just the New Testament, but the whole Bible. Job 37, build at the shoe height. You know, whatever, like what, whatever it is. <coughs> To have that, that, that knowledge and just that understanding and that intimacy of the Bible. Because the more you get, the, the closer you can have that, that type of knowledge, the more the Bible is going to mean to you and you're going to glean even more understanding from. Right. Don't read the Bible a couple times and just be like, well, I read it. Good enough. There's so much more. There's so much more. You should be learning all the time. It's the word of God, not the word of man. The word of God is capable of that. It's endless. But I'm going to leave the rest of that for tonight because tonight we're going over the word of God. But all right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for this amazing book that, uh, that is authored by you. Thank you for giving this, this masterpiece to us to cherish and to love. And I pray that you would please um, help us not to have an attitude of, of dealing with, with reading your word, consuming these words as a drudgery or as a chore, but that you would open up the scriptures to us, help us to understand more, help us to see all these great details and, and um, great truths. Lord, help, help us to, to not just understand them, but then also to retain them. Lord, there's so many things that you've shown me over the years that I feel like I've forgotten, and I pray that you please uh, help all of us with our memories and, and to be able to keep these things in our heart and that you would just teach us, guide us, and, and help us to, to not be ashamed as your workmen, but that we can be used a, as much as possible by you. Even if we ever find ourselves in some random situation where we don't have a Bible handy, we would have enough scripture memorized and enough knowledge to be able to show and, and, uh, and just continue to do work for you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.